Uh, so, uh, firstly, I, I would like to thank Courtley and Nersk for spearheading this training effort, and Ronan to cover a lot of fundamental details that that we use in the in the upcoming sections. So, uh, I'll start with an assumption that majority of the people here are in some form you have used CUDA before and a and, and bit of an uh, experience with SICL in, in some form. So with that, um, feel free to post any questions, at, uh, uh, pause me any moment. Uh, and in this section, I'll talk about uh, cues, more specifically in order cues. And I'll get into details why in order uh, in a bit. Um, so to make things familiar to the users, uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch upon some equivalence in CUDA where possible uh, uh, for sickle equivalence. So the, the, the learning objective of this section is you have heard several times and seen code snippets from Ronan that has the keyword queue. Uh, and, and I'll briefly talk about what is uh, the queue briefly and why do we have out of order and in order execution pattern related to the queue. And more specifically, I'll just dive into in order queues and how, how to use them uh, as that has uh, been a, a lot of uh, use case when you're porting from CUDA specifically. So, uh, so, as you have seen in several slides uh, of Ronan and also your own examples, you might see a sickle queue object. That is the fundamental uh, driver to submit tasks to your, to your hardware. So, so think of it as like a, a CUDA stream where you can enqueue a lot of data movement or kernel launches. So sickle queues, provide a very similar in functionality. I'll go into detail where that different, where differences come from. So as shown in the slide, sickle queues are by default out of order in nature. So things could just go uh, uh, in any order uh, uh, and, and they can even overlap. So the first thing is there is no guarantee of the order and there can be, they can be overlapped depending upon the backend. And this backend could be um, like uh, and for NVIDIA, AMD, FPGAs or whatnot. So uh, since majority of uh, this training is on, since all of the training is on A100s uh, on Perlmutter, I'll stick with equivalence on, on, on CUDA. So as I was saying, CUDA sickle queues are default out of order in execution. So on the left-hand side, you might see a, a DAG, a, a task graph. Uh, with just four kernels. The most important aspect is kernel B and C, they depend upon A. And the last kernel, which holds the results, depends upon the output from B and C. So that's simple. So when you just create cycle Q, okay? So the execution can be uh, A, B, C, D, or A, C, D, D. These are the combinations. So as I've seen, the runtime can choose whichever, uh, 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 it wants to uh, execute first. So this is the default out of order execution pattern. Coming to in order execution pattern, you can choose which kernel to, to be submitted first. So there is an order as it says in the word. So you can create a sickle queue and specify them to be in order. And then this is the most important aspect when you are coming from CUDA. So if you have used CUDA streams, these are fundamentally FIFO. So first in, first out. So to mimic that nature, sickle queues can be made in order to mimic CUDA streams. That, that, that's the equivalence here. So coming to the submission again for the task graph here, you have A, B, C, and D. And if you have scheduled A and then B, C, and D, the runtime chooses to execute us execute this entire uh, DAG in that order. So there is a certainty in how the runtime decides to execute this graph. 
So that's the difference between out of order and in, in order execution. Question is, how do we create an in order queue? So uh, in all the examples and snippets and, and, and whatnot, you might have just seen, okay, sickle queue and people do create a queue, but they don't specify any arguments. So the first argument is nothing but we are just saying a GPU selector. There are, uh, there are a few options. You can run it on CPU by choosing CPU selector, or you could just ignore that. The most important property here is if you add this property for the queue and state it as in order, this will give the queue the in order property and it would not be an out of order by default. This is the only change one needs to be done to have the SQL queue to make it in order and to behave similarly like a CUDA stream. So before I go into a code snippets, if majority of anyone porting the codes in, in math libraries or machine learning projects, when you're taking a CUDA code, which uses CUDA streams, and you might see wrong answers, even though your entire code ported by SQLomatic tool or your handwritten way of CUDA to SQL, if it gives you a wrong answer, the simplest trick or a debugging method is to change your queue creation to make it in order and verify if you're getting the wrong an uh, right answer. If you're getting the right answer, then you might have some race conditions uh, uh, that, that might have been ignored. So that's the tip for in order queues. So coming uh, to this slide, this slide particularly discusses about uh, how do we use an in order queue. So I would like to focus this section, uh, this code snippet into four sections. So let's say we create a buffer. Okay, that's the first part. Second section, if you're seeing my mouse, it says in order queue dot submit. This is nothing but a kernel submission. And in the third section, you have another kernel submission. And the last part is just synchronization using dot read. So if you're using an in order queue, everything is FIFO. So the, this kernel gets submitted first and then the next one. So the ordering is important. And if it is important uh, uh, for your cases, it's better to choose an in order queue. So the difference between out of order and in order is you can make an out of order queue in order by explicitly providing a lot of dependencies. So let's say we have an out of order queue, okay, in this case. If you submit this first kernel, you'll get an event out of it. Take that event, put it into the next one using a keyword called depends on. So these are some just brief information, how you can even make an out of order queue as in order. So one can establish these dependencies between kernels or with the data transfers and make a default out of order queue to behave as an order queue. But establishing dependencies is not an easy task, too much noise. So one can just choose to use in order queue. Similarly for the USM, which is uh, gaining quite a popularity with uh, the SQL 2020 standard because of its uh, pointer nature. So again, you have a kernel submission, parallel four, mem copy, and a parallel four and a mem copy. So if you use an in order queue, everything shown here gets uh, executed in the same way as it's shown here. So the first mem copy, the next one is the kernel submission A, the next is kernel submission B, followed by mem copy, and in the end you have a wait. So one important difference one needs to make here is with USM, you need to synchronize with wait because uh, we are establishing dependencies uh, in, within order queue. With the buffer model, you don't, uh, the dependencies are established automatically as Ron was pointing out earlier. So that's the difference between how do we use an in-order queue in a buffer model and a USM pointer model. Questions here? Okay. Uh, so this is just a quick hands-on session. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, running a demo of a simple source code. This is already on the GitHub links. So 
I'll be briefly running an example showing uh, uh, in order queue using exercise 02. Um, so, okay. Um, hope this is legible. So this is a test case which uh, which shows how we use in order queue. So Abhishek, we're yeah. still we're still seeing the slides. Oh sorry. Let me be sure. Thanks. Yeah that's great yeah. Okay thanks. Okay so I'll briefly show here an example how we use uh, in order queue with buffer and USM. That's the goal of this, of this exercise in particular. Uh, the structure of the code is pretty simple. You can even look at it from the GitHub link. So first I'll talk about how the code is structured. Okay. So first, this is about how do we use buffers with in order queue. So again, I was as I was saying, we create a queue with in order property and this is like an in order queue, which is again, like a CUDA stream. So we have four uh, uh, buffers here. Buffers are nothing but the data structures. You can think of it as an array. So you have four different arrays here, okay? That are declared. And as you see, we have uh, four different submits. So these submits are nothing but four kernel launches, all right? And in the end, we just have a synchronization. So that's the basic structure of how to, uh, of uh, this buffer model. So again, uh, we are just declaring few variables, running four kernel launches and checking the results. That's the structure for, uh, for a buffer model. So, the first kernel launch, which is this section, the kernel A depends upon um, uh, the accessor for uh, uh, input A. So all it's doing is just reading an A and then computing some property. So it's just playing with uh, input A. Moving to the second kernel launch, okay. Uh, this depends upon two different arrays, okay input A, which is read only, and buffer B, which is write. So all we're doing is just uh, doing a summation. So there is a dependency here, okay? Uh, a, which is read only, and this A needs to be computed by this kernel first. So you see the, you see the dependency here. And for the third kernel, you have A and C. Again, this A, is obtained from the first kernel. And C is what we are actually filling. And the last kernel is A again, uh, uh, sorry, B and C, which are obtained from the previous two kernels. So I, I, I guess you have uh, seen the, how the dependencies are established here. And we don't need to explicitly define any dependencies because the buffer model takes care of it. So. It will ensure that the kernel launches are done appropriately. And the data movement is done also. So when you declare these buffers in A, B, C, and out, which are just the host variables, right? Which are here. These are just host variables. When you declare a buffer and use an accessor, all the data transfer to the GPU is done. So think of it as like, a CUDA mem copy of your inputs to uh, inputs uh, uh, host buffers to a device buffer. It's that simple. So we launch all these four kernels and check the results. Coming to the USM case again, we have the 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 host arrays. We create an in order queue. This is a bit different. We don't use buffers here. We use a standard pointers, which everyone is familiar with. So we create device pointers. You can think of it as a CUDA malloc. 
we do explicit mem copy. So we are moving data from host in A to the device in A. So think of this as like uh, these four as like uh, CUDA mem copies. And we launch four different kernels, parallel four. Uh, or you can even use submit too. This is just a syntactic sugar. So we run these four kernels, copy the results back to the host. So again, these are the four mem copies. We do a synchronization and we free the device buffers. So I hope uh, this structure is a bit familiar who are uh, coming from CUDA. So we have two sections. One, one is testing in order queue with buffer. One is testing with uh, USM pointer. So I'm just showing how one can compile the code. Uh, so the most important things are here, the flags. So Clang is LLVM based. I'm here using a DPC++ based implementation that is available as a module uh, on Perlmutter. So this is the module which gives you a DPC++ compiler for SQL. So FSQL is the fundamental flag. FSQL targets, think of it as like uh, which device you're targeting. Uh, so this way you can specify we're targeting NVIDIA architectures. You can change this to an AMD or, or Intel. And this particular flag defines about what, what architecture it is. So you might be familiar from CUDA. So I'm, I'm running this on, on Ampere 100. So uh, I'm defining this as SM80. So these are the, the notable flags that I would just like to point out. If you see warnings, these are just harmless. So I did compile the code and, 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 and I'm running. So all tests should pass. These are, these, all these tests are built with catch two framework. So uh, you should see uh, uh, all these tests uh, pass or fail with good information. Uh, and that's it. Uh, are there any questions? Briefly, do you think we could we could maybe just chat about the the pros and cons of using in order versus out of order um, queues for the CUDA backend? Like, what what um, what would the benefit to out of order queues be as opposed to in order queues? Sure. Uh, yeah, th that's that's an important point. One should discuss. So, if you know when you are designing your frameworks. Or, or, or your projects. If you know that several of your works uh, work with respect to data transfers or kernels can be done concurrently, the benefit is to use out of order there. So the runtime will take care of executing them in, out of order and, and, and for the, both the data transfers and the kernel launches. One drawback with that is you need to keep tabs on the dependencies. So it might come with extra synchronizations. So the your complete code might not be uh, concurrent. You might need to do some dependencies everywhere. So the, 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 the rule of thumb is if you, are, have a SQL, if you have a SQL project, create both in order queue and SQL, out of order queue and start using them uh, like uh, both at the same time. And, and make sure that uh, you get benefits from both. Of course, one needs to be really careful with the synchronizations. And coming to how is it seen behind the scenes, if you take in order queue, it directly maps to a single CUDA stream behind the scenes. So essentially you're playing with a single CUDA stream. If you're taking out of order queue, you might ask a question, how does this map to uh, like the on the NVIDIA hardware. So the way DPC++ implements this is your single out of order queue maps to several CUDA streams behind the scenes. That's the implementation detail. So this good bit of pros and cons, but one needs to be really careful, I would say is if you're coming from a CUDA project which uses CUDA streams, start with an in order queue. And then gradually change that to a, to an out of order queue. Uh, 
that might that might save you a lot of debugging time with uh, with incorrectness. That's great, Abhishek. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any more questions for Abhishek? I have a, maybe a, just a question for the for the audience. I'm just curious if people traditionally use in order queue by default or out of order queue in their application. I'm just curious because most of the time it really depends from your background. Background, for example, I don't know if you come from OpenCL. For you, it's more natural to think using out using uh, sorry out of order queue. Where if you come from CUDA, maybe it's far more natural to use uh, in order queue. So. I'm just curious in this audience what people are using. I see a hand raised uh, from Maku. Hi, yeah, I was uh just waiting for, I, I think the previous question to be answered, that's why. Um, but yeah, I, my question was um, uh, that, is my understanding correct that for out of order queues, uh, the user that is the coder programmer is uh, responsible for uh, doing the dependencies or will the backend try to do the dependencies based on the accessors mentioned? Yeah, that's a good question. I did not make it, uh really uh, good to understand. If you're using a buffer model and with the accessors, then the, the, the runtime will take care of dependencies for you. So using in order and out of order might not make a huge difference. So the runtime will take, to answer your question, mm -hmm. you with the buffer model, the runtime will take care of dependencies uh, to a good extent. If, if you're asking about an USM model, Yes, one needs to explicitly define these uh, dependencies. Okay, yeah, uh, that that makes sense. Thank you. Hi, I, I think I, I just need to add a few comments. I think um, in my and experience i think if if i think we still need to understand the, how the kernels are executed uh, in a program if we know that uh, uh, some of the kernels can be uh, maybe maybe executed in parallel then uh, we can try to use the out of order queue um, but if the if if we know that the kernels will be executed uh, um, in order then I don't think there's a need to 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 use the an out of order queue. Um, so I I think uh, ultimately we have to understand our uh, how kernels are executed in in our program. Uh, because uh, I think um, based on my experience, most of, I don't I don't observe much uh, performance improvement using an out of the order queue, uh, probably because maybe most of the um, kernels they are executed uh, in in order. They are uh, so, um, but I think it's uh, it, it is as 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 Abhishek said, it's good to explore uh, both in order and out of order queues. Thanks, uh, that's a good point. So if you start playing with out of order queue and in order queue, don't expect a, a huge performance boost with out of order queues. The reason being one, your inherent algorithm might not be uh, uh, concurrent. So it cannot run two or more kernels or data transfers concurrent, overlap them. Second is if your kernel has a good bit of occupancy, it uses all the execution units or most of it. Launching a second kernel at the same time might not be feasible. And that limits out of order execution as well. So these are some of the major uh, reasons. One is user defined, where your inherent algorithm cannot be run concurrently. Second is the hardware might not have sufficient resources to run it uh, concurrently. So th that's, that's a good point. Uh, thanks, Amy.
I might add to that as well that um, with an out of order queue, you need to manage a pool of streams, and that actually might have, you know, more overhead than using a single um, stream, as in a an in order queue. So in some cases, the in order queue might be more performant than the out of order queue, um, counterintuitively. Uh, but this is it's it's kind of a an implementation detail, but um, an important one at that. Thanks you. Yeah, to to continue on this subject, I think last year with uh, Abby and other people, we published a little uh, poster on iWocal where we show the how the runtime is the runtime was good enough to to really use the fact that you can run multiple parallel, multiple common in parallel with uh, out of order queues. And uh, the result was, yes, it worked most of the time. So you can overlap, I think this is what Abby said, yeah, overlap data transfer between, for example, host and device, a compute and a device to host using out of order queues. So, so at least the runtime are no capable of of taking care of this kind of optimization, but yes, indeed, it's really, really application dependent and everything is not, if you are a good application or as Abby say, if you are really large kernel and a little uh, data transfer, in this case, you will not benefit from anything, but I think it, it's something good to, um, or maybe it's a really good, uh, if you use buffer and accessors that you don't need to think about anything of that, right? Because you will have the best scheduling possible. The runtime will do the best scheduling for you. So you don't need to think about all of this kind of thing. So it's a little more verbose to write your code because for each kernel, you need to say, okay, I will read, I will write. But uh, the good thing with that, what you, what you gain by doing this kind of thing is like you have the best runtime possible, the best scheduling. So in theory, you will have all this kind of thing automatically for you and you don't need to, to handle all those dependencies. Yes, I think one thing I am, um, because I think an issue is that nowadays um, there are, for, especially for some machine learning workloads, there are hundreds of kernels for a machine learning model. It's not like our traditional um, uh, HPC applications. So it may be, uh, as, as Thomas mentioned, difficult to specify the, the directions of an accessor, like read or write or or, or, or these things. So that's um, so probably I think some people would prefer um, uh, USM styles to um, to buffer styles. Yeah, just to add as well, these machine learning kind of workloads where you have like loads and loads of very small kernels, yeah. uh, the overhead involved with say getting events um, associated with particular kernels, which is needed for SQL because each uh, kernel submission, we need a SQL event and that needs to be meaningful. Um, mm -hmm. That can have quite a high overhead um, in SQL. So in DPC++, we haven't really, um, we haven't fixed this in a satisfactory way necessarily, but in, in Hipsicle, they have, uh, there's an extension called Hipsicle coarse grained events where essentially you can specify uh, that we don't want any events to be recorded, any native events to be recorded if you're submitting work to a single, say, Hipsicle CUDA stream. Uh, and that eliminates a lot of the overhead that's involved between kernel submissions. This is in terms of, say, recording events, CU event records and all that kind of thing. Um, so this is something that, yeah, we're looking at now in DPC++ as well. But Hipsicle has done a lot to kind of... Uh, try and solve this problem in SQL. Yeah, it's good to know. And uh, I, I think that, uh, I, I think I maybe I should mention that uh, probably we can have both in order and out of queues in a program. Um, especially I think probably, although I'm not very familiar with the uh, machine learning models, but I assume that there will be people pro probably could explore, explore some parallelism uh, in, in kernel execution. So maybe a hybrid mode with both in order and out of order queue will, will achieve, achieve the highest performance. Mm -hmm. that's, that's totally correct. But, but even within order queues, 
because we need to still record events around our kernel submission you still mm -hmm. have some overhead involved it's not as much overhead but it is still it can be significant oh because you need to record before the kernel submission and afterwards as well so that we have this event that we could potentially um synchronize with if we're we're doing work on another queue which corresponds to another stream or pool of streams oh i see that yes if you are interested i so it come so maybe for the people from time to time we have a sql i don't know how it's called but people can give the feedback to the sql committee and everything and thanks to that, some application developer yeah, found this exactly this issue that they are a little too, they are latency sensitive, so they submit a lot of small kernel and they want to ready to be optimized for latency and not really throughput. And this creation of event for some backend, for some CUDA backend is pretty expensive. So we are working at the community to try to fix that in a, in a new fashion of our whatever, in a nice fashion. So I, I just put the, in the chat the issue. So we are still in the process of developing the new API. So please, if you have any feedback, and maybe this is just as a, if you don't like something as a seeker, please open an issue, please talk to us, and we'll try to, to, to figure it out, right? Because I think we are still in development and are really eager to, to try to, to expand the spec, to, to improve the usability of the performance in, in seeker. So please. Please give any feedback and any recommendation you have on this kind of things. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I I, I definitely recommend um, if people are interested to try and experiment as well with with Hipsicle, um, not just the, the DPC++ module on, on Perlmutter. Um, obviously, the more compilers and runtimes you use, the better your, your application or the more robust your application might be. Um, 